Hello everyone, welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for February 15, 2017. My name is Kirsten Ambrose and thanks for joining our presentation this month. Our presenter is Dr. Richard Loser, a researcher and clinician from the Thurston Arthritis Research Center here at UNC Chapel Hill. Dr. Loser is the Herman and Louise Smith Distinguished Professor and Director of Basic and Translational Research at Thurston. His primary research goal is to discuss the basic mechanisms relevant to joint tissue destruction in osteoarthritis. Dr. Loser has also participated as a co-investigator in studies on the benefits of exercise and weight loss interventions in older adults with arthritis, with osteoarthritis. Today, he will review the latest updates in osteoarthritis research findings with the focus on translating knowledge of the biology of osteoarthritis into new therapies. Welcome, Dr. Loser. Thanks very much. So I'm really um, pleased to have this opportunity to talk to everyone this afternoon. And um, what I want to discuss is where we are in developing new treatments for osteoarthritis that are targeted specifically at the disease process. We've learned quite a bit about the biology of osteoarthritis over the last several years. But as you know, there's a great need for treatments that would either slow or stop the progression of the disease. So why is there such a need? Well, this is one illustration here. There's been a huge rise in the number of joint replacement surgeries um, for osteoarthritis. This shows data from um, knee replacement surgeries over the last 20 years. And with the growing number of um, people with obesity as well as the aging of the baby boomers, these numbers are supposed to continue to rapidly rise. And I think one of the reasons why we see um, so many joint replacements is that we really don't have any way or any intervention that's effective in um, preventing people from getting to the end stage of the disease where uh, joint replacement ends up being the only, only treatment that, that's, um, that's um, efficacious. So we really need to have some new treatments that would slow or stop the progression of OA um, because of this epidemic of, of um, people with severe end-stage disease and the, and the cost of treating it with something like a joint replacement. So what I want to do today is cover a few um, key points. And so if you remember what's on these next couple of slides, you'll sort of get a summary of, of what I want to go over. So I'm going to review a little bit about the pathogenesis so that um, you can understand some of the targets for intervention. And I've got osteoarthritis with an itis in red because I do want to emphasize that osteoarthritis is truly an inflammatory disease. It's different than inflammatory arthritis when you talk about, say, rheumatoid arthritis, but there's a definite inflammatory component to osteoarthritis when you look in, in the tissues such as cartilage, and I'll show you some evidence for the inflammatory mediators that, that seem to be playing a really important role in joint tissue breakdown in OA. I'm going to discuss the management of osteoarthritis and the concept of what you could call um, disease-modifying OA drugs or D-modes, and some people call these structure-modifying drugs. And I think for these to work in the future as the, they're developed, we're going to have to individualize therapy to the right um, patients, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I think that it's really going to take a combination of both non-pharmacological approaches as well as pharmacological approaches to have truly effective interventions for OA. I also want to review the potential interventions that have been um, studied so far, talking about some of the targets that have been identified. And then I'm going to talk some about the major limitation in the clinical trials to date has been that currently the FDA requires slowing of joint space narrowing. Um, in order to register a, a treatment as disease-modifying. Um, but unfortunately, this has been very difficult to do for a number of reasons, and this has really limited the, the um, development of a lot of disease-modifying drugs. And then finally, we'll talk about the challenges to um, move the field forward. I'm going to talk about phenotyping OA patients a little bit. Um, this is going to be important to pick the right people for the right treatments. Uh, and then there needs to be more advances in both biochemical and imaging markers um, so that we can detect people with early phases of disease and have better ways of monitoring their response to treatments. 
So as you know, there are a number of different um, predisposing factors for osteoarthritis that are shown on the left-hand side of the slide. And osteoarthritis pathology, when it's at the end stage, looks pretty similar no matter what the initiating factor is. But what we've been learning um, is that there are probably different pathways to go from a predisposing factor such as age or obesity to the development of osteoarthritis. And so treatments that are not specific for the pathway may not be effective. Um, so for example, if there's an intervention that affects the pathway from obesity to OA, if you enter people in the study that have joint injury and uh, abnormal joint shape and are not just obese, then you're unlikely to see that your, your agent is going to be very effective. So we're learning what these pathways are that lead to OA from different predisposing factors. And then for clinical trials, it's really going to be important to, to enter the right people with the right predisposing factor, getting the right intervention. We've also been learning that, of course, osteoarthritis not only affects the articular cartilage, but other tissues are involved. And these are really important in disease pathogenesis as well. So for example, if you look here, move my arrow down. If you look here, this is an MRI image of a knee on the femoral side. You can see this white area. This is um, a bone marrow lesion. And these are lesions where there is an increased remodeling of the bone with sort of local necrosis and fibrosis. And these have been shown to correlate with both symptoms and with disease progression. So there are processes occurring in bone that we're starting to understand that are important. This MRI also shows some significant synovitis up in this area. So the role of synovitis is being appreciated much more. Then within the knee joint, of course, the meniscus is involved, the ligaments. And so it's really um, now considered a disease of the joint as an organ. And the involvement of these other sites, um, besides the cartilage, is probably really important in the progression of the disease. So in a study looking at predictors of cartilage loss over 30 months, people that had a meniscal tear or meniscal extrusion where the meniscus is out of its normal place in the joint, or synovitis or high-grade MRI features, particularly those bone marrow lesions that I showed you, these were all people that were going to be at much higher risk of losing their cartilage over 30 months. So these tissues are interacting with each other. And as I mentioned, synovitis is becoming um, appreciated again as an important factor in osteoarthritis. This is one study that looked at end-stage disease, people that were on, um, going on to joint replacement, and they looked at their synovium um, after, after joint replacement surgery. And you could see that in some people that had really severe synovitis, that's shown here as a grade three, and overall, the people that had end-stage disease, about one-third of them had grade one, one-third of them had grade two, and one-third of them had grade three. So synovitis is probably not important in everybody, but there's certainly a subset of people with OA where it's becoming apparent to be a driving factor. We're also appreciating more and more the different inflammatory factors that are active in OA joints. Um, this is one particular study that used a proteomics approach and they found a number of different factors that were involved in um, the innate immune system and um, pro-inflammatory factors that signal through toll-like receptors. And this includes a number of cytokines and chemokines as well that interact with these factors signaling through toll-like receptors. And when they looked in the synovial fluid and measured some of the um, cytokines and chemokines that are shown in this table, what I think was interesting is that Shown here in blue, two of the cytokines, interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor, that have probably received the most attention, were actually present at very, very low levels within the synovial fluid. And you can see other factors like interleukin-6 at much, much higher levels, um, more than tenfold higher levels, some of these, VEGF, NCP1, IP1, and MIG. So there are probably a number of inflammatory factors that are involved in the OA process. And to be able to have effective therapies, we're going to have to determine which ones are going to be the most important to, to target. Clearly, targeting tumor necrosis factor has worked really well for rheumatoid arthritis. But to date, that 
inhibition of TNF doesn't seem to be as effective in, in osteoarthritis in preclinical studies. And what's fascinated me has been the development of um, this long list of factors that have been shown to be present and active in articular cartilage that are important in driving the breakdown of the tissue. So on the left-hand side, you can see there are a number of cytokines and other inflammatory factors. And these have all been shown to be present. And these stimulate degradation and inhibit synthesis. On the other side, there are a number of growth factors that are also produced by chondrocytes and present in cartilage. And these operate um, to increase synthesis and inhibit degradation. And what you see as osteoarthritis progresses is that the activity of the pro-inflammatory side, the degradative side, really overwhelms the activity of the anabolic side. And this is what drives the production of the matrix metalloproteinases and agrokinases, which are really important enzymes, along with other proteases, that degrade, degrade the cartilage matrix. So I think by looking at this si slide, you can understand that there's a very complex biology involved in osteoarthritis, a number of different mediators that could ser um, serve as potential targets uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about. So just to summarize pathogenesis and then the rest of the time I'm going to talk about treatment, there are a number of systemic factors that are involved in promoting the development of osteoarthritis, a number of biomechanical factors that are, of course, very important as well, and then a number of different tissues within the joint that are affected, the meniscus, ligaments, and the synovium. And all of these are really working together through a complex biological process that involves a number of cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, matrix metalloproteinases, to result in degradation of the cartilage and changes in bone, as well as changes in the other tissues shown above. Uh, and all of this is working together to drive the progression of osteoarthritis. So what about treatment? So for those of you who are basketball fans, you'll recognize um, Mike Krzyzewski, the Duke coach on the left, and Roy Williams, the um, UNC coach on the right. And of course, they're quite competitive with each other. Um, and I'm using them here as illustrations, not just because um, Duke and UNC are going to be playing again next week, but because both of these two coaches have suffered from osteoarthritis and both underwent um, knee replacement surgery this past summer. So of course, in treating arthritis, we want to relieve pain, um, reduce inflammation, and improve function. But importantly, what I'm going to talk about today is, are there any ways that we can halt progression of the disease? So currently, when we see patients with osteoarthritis, they're often at this um, stage where they have radiographic changes and symptomatic disease, and we're starting our intervention at a point in time where the disease has already progressed um, fairly far. So for future therapies, the idea is we really need to pick people up at earlier stages and begin the intervention before they progressed to advanced stages, which are going to be really um, difficult to reverse. And to be able to do this, we need better markers, um, risk biomarkers that are either biochemical uh, or imaging markers or even mechanical markers that would um, find people with early stage disease and then predict who's going to advance to the more severe disease. So in terms of the potential targets that would be used, this is a list of um, potential disease-modifying drugs that have either been looked at or being looked at currently. So starting at the top, um, inhibitors of the matrix degrading enzymes, since these are really important in joint tissue destruction. If you could block the enzyme activity itself, that could be a benefit. I mentioned the important role of bone in osteoarthritis, and there's been a fair amount of work looking at um, bone anti-resorptives that could also affect um, cartilage as well. Cartilage anabolic factors, anti-cytokines, anti-inflammatories, um, cell signaling inhibitors, and I'll finish with a, just a few comments about nutraceuticals and visco supplementation. So in terms of um, matrix degrading enzymes, 
there have been a number of MMP inhibitors that have been tested. So far, the MMP inhibitors that are not specific have a lot of toxicity. So companies are working specifically on MMP13 inhibitors. This is the enzyme that's really important in degrading type 2 collagen. And so this is probably a really important target for therapy. There are also um, small mo molecule inhibitors to the agrokinases. These are enzymes that break down proteoglycans in cartilage that are in early phase trials, uh, but their pharmacokinetics need to be improved. And then um, an inhibitor to something called cathepsin K was tested, but it had toxicity. And interestingly, doxycycline was tested as a D mode in a really early tr um, trial because it does have some MMP inhibitor activity, but unfortunately it had um, very little effect on, on disease progression in OA. I mentioned disease-modifying drugs that might target bone. So calcitonin has been studied, um, although the um, studies were terminated and there's a consideration that calcitonin in men can increase the risk for prostate cancer, so it's probably not going to be uh, moving forward. Uh, strontium, which is a bone-acting agent, was tested but had a less than clinical meaningful effort. I mentioned the capsaicin K inhibitors. Estrogens are still of interest, and um, at least in the Women's Health Initiative study, um, there was decreased hip replacement on women that were in the estrogen replacement arm. Um, preclinical studies of PTH and PTH-like peptide, and then I mentioned the bisphosphonates that initially looked pretty promising. So this was lo one large bisphosphonate study of residronate in over 2,000 people. And in terms of a biomarker, it decreased the act, um, levels of a biomarker of collagen degradation called CTX2, but there was no difference in the um, WOMAC pain outcome and no difference in radiographic progression. So even though in preclinical studies, bisphosphonates looked pretty promising, they failed. So the question is, why did it fail? And I think two reasons. One is that using plain films to um, measure disease progression is just not going to work. They're, they're not sensitive enough, um, and I'll show you some data on that. And the people that were entered in this study were not specifically entered because they had bone involvement with their OA. And so the, tar the therapy wasn't really targeted to a specific patient population. So in terms of the x-ray changes, um, as I mentioned, the FDA requires slowing of um, joint space narrowing, but you can see that in the um, patients that were entered into the COSTAR study, almost all of them had no to little change at all in their joint space width over the 24 months of the study. And there was only a small percentage, 2% that had a great decline and 7% that had a modest decline. So your chances of picking this up, even a large study, is, is pretty low. And just again to demonstrate how on plain x-rays you really don't see any changes over 24 months, but on the MRI you can see here's an area of significant cartilage loss. Um, there are also studies looking at anabolic agents, so bone morphogenic proteins. Um, there's a lot of hype about stem cells, and so far um, I think we haven't seen really good studies to judge whether or not stem cells are going to be effective or not. Platelet-rich plasma, there's also a lot of hype around that, but very um, poor studies. And to me, the biological rationale for platelet-rich plasma is not very good. <clears throat> the growth factors that are present in this are not ones that I think would be of benefit and could even be harmful to the joint um, by stimulating fibrosis and bone formation. One that is in a phase two, finished a phase two trial is FGF18, um, which is one that's going to, I think, be con um, studied further in a phase three trial um, and is the most promising of the anabolic agents. In terms of anti-cytokine therapies, um, there have been several phase two studies looking at inhibition of IL-1. Um, there's a study on IL-6 chemokine receptor called CCR2, and to date the studies on inhibiting TNF have not been very effective. So currently the biggest interest is still in IL-1, and it will be interesting to see how some of these um, studies come out.
But what about um, glucosamine? I think overall there isn't really good evidence at all that glucosamine is helpful for um, osteoarthritis. Um, there have been a number of studies, the GATE study in particular, that failed to show any effects for symptoms or for radiographic progression. And another recent study um, just published uh, last month that showed no effect on symptoms or function. And very few positive studies in the literature, which are usually not as well done as the ones that have been negative studies so far. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these other agents because uh, I want to save some time for, for questions. The one thing I did want to mention that's not a disease-modifying drug but that you will probably hear more about in the near future are treatments that are inhibitors of nerve growth factor. So tenuzumab is a monoclonal antibody developed by Pfizer that blocks nerve growth factor and nerve growth factor has been found to be an important pain mediator. And so this is a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 showing pretty good improvement in pain um, with different doses of nerve growth factor. The problem that occurred was that um, in some of the early phase three studies, they noticed the subgroup of people that had worsening of their osteoarthritis who were on the anti-nerve growth factor um, and went to um, knee replacement sooner than was expected. And so they halted all the trials and they looked to see if there was anything that was associated with those that went on to have knee replacement. And it appeared that people that were taking non-steroidals plus receiving anti-nerve growth factor were at higher risk. So um, they were allowed to restart these studies but exclude the use of NSAIDs. And there are several of these that are coming to completion that we should hear about soon, and I'm sure they're going to go up for FDA approval pretty soon. So again, anti-nerve growth factor will be to target pain in people that aren't responsive to other standard therapies, but this is not a treatment that will target disease progression, and in fact, if we're not careful who we give it to, could even potentially cause more rapid disease progression. So in terms of moving forward, um, we're going to have to come up with targeted therapies that look at osteoarthritis phenotypes. So these could be risk factor phenotypes based on whether or not your osteoarthritis is developed after an injury versus being obese or age-related away, or tissue phenotypes, as I mentioned, bone remodeling, uh, cartilage, and other targets at the tissue level. And we need better um, imaging and biochemical markers for early detection and prediction of progression. I didn't have time to talk about these. Uh, a lot have been looked at, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and hopefully being able to monitor the efficacy with these markers. And then we need better preclinical models. A lot of these disease-modifying drugs that have been tested and failed looked really good in preclinical models, uh, such as in mice or in rats, but then failed when they got to humans. And I think one of the major issues is that they use really young animals in these studies. And when you try to translate that into a treatment for an adult human um, in an age of inappropriate animal model, then I think that, that could be a major issue. So I just need to acknowledge the funding that supported a lot of our work that's, um, that's helped me understand this disease quite a bit better. And now I'd be happy to, um, to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Loser. That's uh, quite a complicated subject area that you um, certainly help to make a little bit more digestible for those of us who, <laughs> who aren't quite so uh, knowledgeable of the deep science, so I appreciate that. Um, again, for everybody, we'll take some questions down there in the chat box if you have one. And um, uh, one thing I was going to say, perhaps your way forward slide is indicative of of also the history of, of why some of these drugs have been so challenging to identify and um, and show success in in OA. You know, certainly we have some really effective drugs in rheumatoid arthritis and some other forms of arthritis, but OA seems to have struggled. Um, perhaps it's related to some of these issues, you think, or just our lack of understanding of the disease process. I, I think it, it it's basically related to the fact that OA is really not a single condition and the 
treatments that have been tested so far, everybody with OA has been lumped together. But if you just look at somebody who's had an ACL tear and developed post-traumatic OA, there are a lot different factors involved in that person than in someone who's, say, very obese and has developed OA associated with obesity. And so I think to be more successful, we need to understand the biology that's responsible for specific subsets of OA and have treatments that would target their particular um, biology rather than trying to lump everybody together. That certainly makes sense. You know, on the other end of it, um, we're, we're mindful when we look at physical activity and strategies for managing OA symptoms in the absence of, of um, effective treatments, some of which you've described. It's, you know, it's not one size fits all there either. You know, certain people do better with certain types of exercise than others given uh, limitations and disabilities. So it certainly makes sense that, that it would be true for any, uh, any therapies. Right. So I see a question about targeting agrokinases hasn't been effective as hoped. Um, I think that part of the issue around that has been the pharmacokinetics of the inhibitors for agrokinases. Um, so in animal models, at least, if you knock out specific agrokinases, it's pretty effective in, in either inhibiting OA or slowing progression. But when they started testing agrokinase inhibitors, I think a big issue is that you need to have the inhibitor be able to get to chondrocytes where the agrokinases are being produced. And that's been part of the issue. And so I think um, they haven't completely given up on agrokinases yet, but the pharmacokinetics of the inhibitors has been the issue. And then the other, other possibility is that at least in adult human OA, that maybe it's other matrix metalloproteinases that are as important or more important than agrokinases, and so only inhibiting one enzyme maybe is not going to be effective, uh, and we're going to have to inhibit more than just agrokinases. Uh, the next question is about obesity and um, a causative role in OA, biomechanical versus pathophysiologically. I think that's a, an important question. Um, and it seems to be a combination of increased joint loading, but it's certainly not increased joint loading alone because there's lots of evidence that obesity and the associated m metabolic disturbances and pro-inflammatory state plays a role. And um, it's interesting because obesity is associated, associated with hand away, and it's much harder to give a uh, biomechanical rationale for obesity and hand OA than it would be for knee OA. So I think there's a growing body of evidence that, that obesity and its metabolic changes, and as I mentioned, there are a number of cytokines and adipokines made by fat that seem to affect joint tissues, that it's probably a combination of factors that, that are important. Question about stem cells for treatment of OA, and my, my thoughts again about platelet-rich plasma. You know, for stem cells, they've been used in two different ways. One is the concept of cartilage engineering and using that as a, an approach to heal cartilage. And that's been a total failure. And I think in part it's because trying to engineer cartilage that stays in place and is biomechanically sound and can withstand with, um, the, the mechanics that are placed upon it has been a huge challenge. And if you think about a way involving the joint as an, as an organ, the bone is altered in the knee, the meniscus and ligaments are altered, the synovium is changed. And so if you merely try to engineer cartilage, you're not going to be able to fix everything within the joint. And so that's another reason why I don't think stem cells for cartilage engineering are going to get very far for at least um, arthritis. If it's for an early sports injury, there's probably some potential hope if the rest of the joint is normal. The other thing stem cells have been used for is to um, take advantage of their anti-inflammatory properties. So stem cells do produce some um, anti-inflammatory mediators. And so injecting stem cells that will sit in the synovium and produce these mediators could be of some benefit. But to date, there's really no good 
evidence that, that they've been helpful. So I think a lot more work needs to be done. And as I mentioned, platelet-rich plasma, very few good studies have been done. And the type of growth factors that are present in platelet-rich plasma, platelet-derived growth factor, TGF, beta, FGF, all of these growth factors could be harmful for the joint because they stimulate fibrosis and they stimulate bone formation. TGF beta is the major factor that stimulates osteophytes to form. So if you're injecting these into the joint over the long term, I think we could be causing more harm than good. And the studies that have been done so far, it's, it's you know, you have to consider the placebo effect of injecting something into the joint where people respond simply to having an injection, whether it's saline or platelet-rich plasma. So we really need good randomized trials, and I think we really are going to need long-term studies to make sure that these agents are um, not harmful. Any other, other questions? Somebody is Looks typing. Like somebody is typing. Yep. These are great questions from our group today. Everybody's got some. Uh, I think everyone's curious, you know, like I said before, the OA treatments have just um, not been quite as prevalent or as effective as, as for some other illnesses. I think people are really looking for some good stuff. We do have one about anti-fibronectin fragment therapies. Oh, yeah, from Chris. <laughs> I, I know Chris, and it's interesting that he would ask that because maybe he knows that I do work on fibronectin fragments as a, as a model. Um, so for those those of you who don't know about this particular area, as the matrix starts to break down in arthritis, matrix proteins, including fibronectin, are broken down and form fragments. And these fragments feed back and stimulate cells such as the chondrocytes to produce more of the mediators, the MMPs and inflammatory factors. So it's part of a, um, a vicious cycle. So We've been doing a lot of work with fibronectin fragments to try to look at the signaling pathways that they activate with the hope that um, specific signaling inhibitors would be um, efficacious in terms of blocking the signals that are turning on the production of matrix degrading enzymes and cytokines and so forth. So that's where our particular focus has been. Um, it's hard to block the action of the fragments themselves um, because you'd have to be able to get some type of an inhibitor into the cartilage matrix and block the interaction with the receptors. I think blocking the signals that are produced are going to be, um, have the greatest chance of being effective. So that's, that's an area that, that we're still working on. So a question about progressive resistance training compared to the current pharmacological interventions. Um, that's an excellent question. You know, I've been involved in a lot of exercise studies. Um, we're completing one right now on high intensity versus low intensity strength training that's led by Steve Messier uh, at Wake Forest called the START study. So I think that's going to be a study to tell us how effective um, high intensity strength training is. As you're probably aware, exercise and then for people that are overweight, exercise plus weight loss has been found to be effective. I haven't seen a head-to-head -head comparison with pharmacological interventions. Um, so most of the, the trials that we've been involved with, we enter people that are on analgesics and other agents for their osteoarthritis, um, but we haven't randomized people to receive pharmacologic intervention versus exercise intervention. But the improvements we see um, in terms of reduced pain and improved function either match or are better than the improvements you see in pharmacological interventions, but um, they haven't been looked at head to head. It looks like this is Chris great. Has I see another that Yep. I appreciate everybody sticking around. We're a little bit over our time, which is fine. We'll keep going and answering questions as people have them for a few more minutes. Um, I'll post our next talk up there for next month that hopefully you can join us if anybody needs to sign off now. Thank you for, for joining us today, but certainly we'll wait for a couple more questions to come in if anybody has any. So Chris, Purple has a question about progress and validation of er early markers of OA. Um, there has been a, 
a large initiative um, through the osteoarthritis initiative um, and the biomarker studies that are looking at a panel of markers because it looks like there's not so far a single marker that can be um, predictive of early disease or predictive of progression. And so there's no conclusion yet in terms of a, a specific marker, but this panel that's being looked at, I think we're going to see more information coming out in the next year or two um, because there are a whole lot of studies that are underway right now. And in terms of imaging, um, there is agreement on all the different tissues that are involved in OA that you can image. There's not agreement on what the best indicator of early disease and progression would be. Um, clearly, synovitis is important, and in the knee, the meniscus is important, so those are two structures that seem to be uh, predictors of progression and associated with early disease. Um, and again, the imaging side of OA is being very actively investigated right now. So I'm thinking that really in the next year or two, we're going to have a lot more information on both biochemical markers and imaging markers as well. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, Dr. Loser. It looks like uh, no more questions have come in. So I greatly appreciate your time today and giving us the latest and greatest on OA and what we can look forward to. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a good day, and we'll see you next month.